If there is to be peace in our world, then there must be peace in the nations. And if there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in our cities. And if there is to be peace in our cities, there must be peace between neighbors. But if there is to be peace among our neighbors, there must be peace in the home. But if there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in our hearts. Good evening and welcome to this hour of observance, this hour of sharing in space with one another, and this hour of honoring peace in our world as we mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's brutal invasion in Ukraine. My name is Reverend Christopher Rowe. I serve as the senior minister here at Fountain Street Church, a church that is fiercely dedicated to peace and to love and to justice and into compassion. And on behalf of everyone who calls this their spiritual home, it is an honor to welcome each and every one of you to this special occasion. I am honored to share this pulpit this evening with many voices, many poets, many writers. It is a privilege to call this evening part of my life with each one of you. So thank you for being here. As we move through this evening, you will hear from roughly 18 different poets, each with their own poem or their piece of writing to offer to us as we hold the tension of loss and grief with hope and love. Welcome to this time of holding that tension and welcome to this vigil of peace. We will continue by welcoming our very own Don Wheeler to the pulpit. Good evening. Uh, as a member of the Fountain Street Poetry Reading Group that uh, helped coordinate this, uh, I was asked to start. And uh, if anyone is interested in joining that group, we'd be happy to have you. This is titled Memorial by Amanda Gorman. When we tell a story, we are living memory. In ancient Greece, the muses, the dainty-footed daughters of memory, were thought to inspire artists. It isn't knowing, but remembering that makes us create. This would explain why so much great art arises from trauma, nostalgia, or testimony. But why alliteration? Why the pulsing percussion, the string of syllables? It is the poet who pounds the past back into you. The poet transcends telling or performing a story and instead remembers it, touches, tastes, traps its vastness. Only then can memory, previously marooned, find safe harbor within us, feel all these tales crushing our famished mouth. From the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are told that we will not build a peaceful world by following a negative path. It is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for peace. We must concentrate not merely on the negative expulsion of war, but on the positive affirmation of universal and everlasting peace. We must see that peace represents a sweeter music a cosmic melody that is far superior to the discords of war. Somehow, we must transform the dynamics of world power and its struggle from the negative nuclear arms race, which no one can win, to a positive contest that harnesses humanity's creative genius for the purpose of making peace and prosperity a reality for all the nations of this world. In short, we must shift from an arms race to a peace race. 
as we prepare to move deeper into this time of poetry and cosmic melodies, I invite you to hear the words of this meditation we offered from this very sanctuary one year ago this evening. In whatever is your tradition or your level of comfort, I invite you to pray or meditate or simply hold space for just a moment as we welcome the deep peace that abides and passes all understanding. Divine spirit of peace be with us now and with our world. Throughout the generations and beyond all differences, peace has called our world towards love, justice, and flourishing, even when humanity has not embraced its call to its fullness. In a moment in which such unimaginable suffering joins in the lived experience of the already pervasive presence of suffering, injustice, and oppression in our world, we pray that our hearts will be open to greater awareness, deeper understanding, personal ownership, and unified action. Tonight, we pray for the presence of peace once again in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. And we pray for the commitment to claim our role in nurturing a more loving, just, and compassionate world. May we be filled with the spirit of peace. May we hold these prayers and commitments in our hearts, and may the presence of love be known in the hearts of all. And may it be so. May it be so. I would like to invite GF forward as we move into the rest of our vigil. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Fountain Street for hosting this. Uh, everyone should have a program, and the readings will be done in order, alphabetical order. There's one small change, one addition, actually. Nellie DeVries is going to be reading after Marcia Davis. Uh, when I was thinking about what to say to start this, I came across a story not too long ago that said some people are a little bit weary of reading about the war in Ukraine. I think, well, what do the Ukrainians think about that? I imagine they're a little bit tired of it, too. Um, and I was thinking, what can poetry do? It can't stop war. It can't stop fighting and killing. But what it can do is remind us that we are part of a world, that we are human. And in the idea of reading to each other, brought to mind a poem by William Stafford, the last stanza, which I'd like to read. The poem is called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. So as we read to you tonight, our aim is to dispel quite a bit of that darkness. Thank you for listening. My name is Greg Bliss. When I was asked to participate, it was a very humble moment. Um, I immediately knew that the situation that I would write about was the, uh, to me, a, a most humane response to an inhumane invasion. And that is uh, one of the first stories that came out is that the Russian soldiers were given opportunity to call home. It really struck me that in the face of an uncivilized act of aggression, civilized response is possible. The piece is called Mamasha e Papasha. In this morning, soldiers say, I wish to 
Telephone? Mamasha e Papasha. Although I do not wish to burden your voice, I, eager to bear your voice, for I am in territory of Ukraine, of which to me, even now, so soon ago, this becomes surprise. But I am warm. My boots are dry. Please listen to me. I am prisoner of war. Do not worry for me, but this write down, imperative to contact my unit. Say to them, son is captive in territory of Ukraine. I am aggressor, Mamashi Papasha. They cannot let me go. Listen to me. I have been sent to death. My battalion entirely now deceased. No one takes away bodies. Comrades left layered in ditches. No one getting death note. I will be put to trial. Listen to me. Mamasha I, I promise when gorilla behind me shouts to kill them all, I target high into windows to aim at clouds, to become clouds in trousers with lips enormous, full of confessions, so angels might snatch bullets before erupting inside children. But windows, so far above us, we could not fly to stop. Rather, rest aim into pulsing shadows, blurry lines, blurry faces, these gorillas shouting, Innocence stretching lungs until gorillas with innocence become bruised, electric symphony. So much. So much so I cannot keep beats within measures or time within face of compass dial. Hours upon days this music, ceaseless, until wolverines descend upon us, crouching without ammunition, fingers too frost fat to pull razor triggers. Wilding wolverines waking us upon delivery with staccato stories, dramatic how we swim through broken glass into their holy throats. As if we had become blood and flesh of our beloved. So certain I became, no, no. But I had become Reshkalnikov, with blunt axe beating Alonia. Not me, it was, I swear. But my glistening gorilla body, uncertain whether to take copper or cypress cross, my body insufficient, unworthy, not communicating correctly, forcing feverishly to say no. But they have surrounded us there and there and forever there, watching this axe fall clumsily. How could there be so many Lisavetas? We could not kill them all. We could not kill them all. And this gorilla beside myself. Then, in the thin darkness of their dying, we smell their orbits approaching. So many wolverine eyes, diesel commingled with plaster and urine. How, with clever claws, these bounding beasts descended upon us. Mamasha, Papasha, wolverines drag me to Wolverine Den, where I will tumble together with bandaged comrades. Two empty bottles of cheap vodka clanking dully upon one another. My eyes open wounds now, recalls thick frost lashes at holiday swim dive. Surely that is not once me. But presently glad not to be hive mind, drove, collecting Chernobyl nectar, stories addling through den, hair dropping in clumps on red forest floor, lucky to have gorilla body captured by wolverines who find my flesh too repugnant to swallow. Mamashi Papasha, they trade POWs potentially. Please have village magistrate speak highly of me. In photo album on library cabinet beside silver statue, I win for swim championship. Photograph of Dyatya, our beloved Yevgeny, proud in field of poppies, Kandahar or Khan, 1982, vibratory, grasping his Kalashnikov, raised high, giving magistrate, give magistrate this photo. For here, there are no flowers, no hot summer breeze to make hero as once Jadia. Yet I am warm, my boots are dry. Cracked Wolverine lips tell me my papasha butchers their children, 
My papasha butchers their women, my papasha butchers their sons, my papasha butchers their papashas, my papasha forgets whom he conscripts, abandons me to Wolverine, so I make wide my nostrils from swallowing coal black smoke of blast burning T90s, remembering comrades scratching like chickens to break free when I hear myself wretch, put not my papasha, put not my papasha. I no more my, any father's son do not remember me like this. Maybe my body does these, or this gorilla behind me. I detect it thumping, yet cannot determine if heaving monster is far away or softly picking its teeth inside me. Mamashi, Papasha, these days soon upon us, you remember in the spring at noon when you visit Dyadya, our beloved Yevgeny, in the cemetery at Medichinsky, where crocus and rhododendron blossom near cerulean blue fences, framing so many heroes sleeping. Ah, sushki bread and tvorek cheeses with riesling and plave on those plentiful benches, laughing together, shuffling photographs of Dyadya, when our family sang and danced these forever years before. Mamashi Papasha. As you clink glasses with Jadja's marker and lean against smooth oxide iron for final conversation, do not tell Jadja I am in territory of Ukraine. Do not tell him how Wolverines find me. Do not tell him how I came to discover this blunt axe. Masha, Ipapasha, listen to me. Do not speak my name. Yet I am warm. My boots are dry. Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Patricia Clark, and I'm going to read my poem. If you hear a bit of an echo at the end, um, your literary um, tuner is picking up a little bit of Ezra Pound. <clears throat> and I wanted to invite you to another poetry event, if I might, um, later in, in March. My husband, Stanley Cromer, who's a painter, he and I are gonna have an exhibit here in the Keeler Lounge, uh, meditative works called River Walker, po Poems and Paintings about walking along the Grand River. Uh, so I hope you might come. There's an opening reception on March 22nd, a Wednesday night from five to seven, and we'll have jazz and some refreshments. So I hope you might come. And see and hear River Walker. So this is my poem on the night when Russian troops attack a power plant. There's a small fire burning now near a concrete building, white as bone, and a cooling tower in Ukraine, its largest nuclear power plant, and the experts gathered on MSNBC are trying to decide if it's part of a plan by Russian troops or an accident. Which would be better, we wonder. We hate the word accident so carelessly random, but plan, too, is ugly. They are trying to scare the Ukrainian people into surrender, trying to make all of us around the world see ourselves on the brink. They keep showing a clip with tracer fire, like horizontal licking flame. We see no soldiers' faces, no helmets or uniforms or guns. Now they go on explaining to those of us too young or too indifferent what a cold war is, why a hot war won't do when there are weapons with nuclear warheads. 
see how their tips look like dunce caps in black or sometimes orange. Talking of hot wars or cold as though it's all so simple like water coming out of the tap. There's a small fire burning in Ukraine tonight and we pray they put it out so we can sleep along with refugees in trains, in strange beds in other countries, and deep in stations of the metro, faces of children, mothers, petals on a dark bough. Well, I made it. I'm David Cope. Uh, my poem has two parts. Uh, the first is sort of a memory that stirred up in me when this war started. I was in China in 2019, and I thought of the horrors of how each nation accepts mass murder and calls it something patriotic. Uh, so it starts off as a sort of litany of horrors. The second part, the coda, is a series of blessings because I couldn't leave you with that sort of thought. Uh, so, Ukraine. Ah, Ukraine. Years roll in a dead march. Saul killing thousands, David his tens of thousands, Arjuna the killer spurred on by Krishna, endless wars in China, Chen Xiang walking among shattered bones, Du Fu hidden in his hut, lamenting horrors he witnessed, fleeing never to return. A hundred years of killing celebrated after Agincourt. Then rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air. Moscow shattered, Waterloo, Sumter, Gettysburg, Atlantis flames, Richmond in ruins, Sheridan amok in Shenandoah, Sand Creek, Tongue River, Custer, Wounded Knee, Ypres, Verdun, the Somme, the Blitz, Dresden, the first death, the child in London. What stirs such men? Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, Stalin, now Putin, the KGB thug, become manic nation butcher. What rage boils in their dreams that they could act as now in the European sunflower breadbasket, forcing a good man to defiance, his people's heroism, cities bombed to silence, refugees in millions fleeing nightmares. What history? What twisted psyches in our human condition? What eke homo shatters lives, bodies, peace, kindness, compassion? Night after night, I follow the moon walking, the sky shining, wondering at such tranquility, such silence, such a gift, tossed for nightmares, endless as hell's dark road, the agony of millions. 
Thus spoke the old man, hoping to spend his last years in peace, head in hands, sleepless nights, with this hellish repetition again. And the codon, I had to get out of that for a while. Blessing for Volodymyr Zelensky, his wife Olena, their children. Blessing for the wives and children living their nightmares, trapped on a long and dangerous road, even crossing borders to safety fraught with pain. Blessing for the fathers, husbands and brothers forced to shoulder rifles, rocket launchers, Molotov cocktails, tearful by night and in quiet moments, wondering if they'll live to see their loved ones again, if indeed those they love are safe. Blessing for my poet friend, Svetlana Yokimovich, who translated the great dissident poet Vasil Stus, dead in a Soviet prison, 1985, still celebrated for his great courage today. Blessing on the ru ruined cities of Ukraine, that they might live again. Blessing on the Odessa Opera and Ballet Theater, the long history of cultural e excellence throughout Ukraine. Blessing on the memory of Anna Akhmatova, born in Odessa, recalled now as Anna of all the Russias. Blessing on her poems, that they continue to speak truth to tyrants, that they liberate the minds and hearts of all who open her leaves, she, shining star of world poetry. Blessing on all the nations who take in their refugees, especially Poland. Feed and help them find their lives, to, excuse me, beyond despair. May their families be reunited. Blessing on those praying for the nation, the people, the children, that their dreams bear fruit and touch those in need. May Ukraine rise from the ashes free and celebrate liberation and renewal. May the nation know liberty at last, celebrating survival in wild, whirling dance and song. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Marcia Davis, and although I live in Holland, Michigan, I still have Jersey girl roots at heart and uh, lean toward a bit of direct communication and writing style. And I, um, that's why I think I'm drawn to the minimalist Japanese form of haiku, because you have to really say it very concisely. I also love the shape of the rhythm of haiku. So these 12 scenes from the Borderlands, the Borderlands is another name for Ukraine. Um, these are based on stories from friends and family, as well as news reports from last year. Scenes from the Borderlands. Sun warms scorched black earth Daffodils hide underground. They too fear evil. Driving to dentist, their path altered by missiles, homeless, hungry, shocked. The green corridor swells with women and children, cats, dogs, guinea pigs, she stayed for the dogs, kenneled strays, waiting for homes, 
her home in splinters. He has two passports, chooses to stay with orphans, dies a hero there. Imprisoned in cribs, Chernobyl's precious fallout, whisked by plane to Spain. No planting this spring, sunflower seeds stacked on shelves, their blooms etched in mines. Tanks in yards, smashed bikes, soldiers lie face down, she says, people are like meat. Survived Buchenwald, bedridden in Dnipro, escapes to Deutschland. Donetsk's trapped holdouts signal May Day on May Day, leaving hell behind. Volunteer efforts, flak jackets, food, bedding, clothes, what you do in war. Moon over Kharkiv caresses treasured landmarks, softens gaping holes. P.S. Screw you, Putin. Thank you. My name is Nellie DeVries. Um, my poem is in response to an article I read in the um, Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm a recently retired nurse, and now I get to take care of my grandson. And the article was about handing over a son to strangers, and I just cannot grasp it. Um, the form of my poem is a golden shovel. If you read the last word in each line, it forms um, a sentence from, a couple sentences from Ilya Kaminsky's poem. He's a Ukrainian American. And his words were, um, we lived happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. So those are the uh, end words of my reflection on the article. I call it Falling Houses. What golden shovel can dig us out of the turmoil we live in? Some have only always lived in trouble, while others have gone on happily for three score years and more. One boy, Hassan, during his first 12 months, lived in war, then fled the country with his family, his father a victim of that war. For a decade in the Ukraine, they survived on buckwheat and potatoes at his grandparents' house. That all changed when, again, a wall of war. Again, the fear, the fighting. They sent their teens to Bratislava when their country was bombed to live with their oldest brother. Then came the day, no other option. The mother sent her young son into other people's hands people in other lands and trains and houses, acquaintances, strangers, helpers stepping forward like we would hope to do if we were there. Later, the mother protested leaving her natal Ukraine with grandmother and a dog, but they had to flee the army, the going rough. 
Were it not for more helpers, it would have not been enough. The generosity of Slovaks, the family reunited. It's a story we take in hand to read again and weep. We are opposed to war, brutality, and power mongering. Let them dig deep into their own backyards who grasp for more, but leave the innocence to thrive and go to school. Perhaps it's not a shovel, but a rule we need, a golden rule. Is it enough? Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to GF and uh, Reverend Chris Rowe, all the people from Bound Street Church who've supported and hosting this event. We're here to honor the struggles of the Ukrainian people and not let war fatigue, as GF referred to, blur our commitment to them. And this anthology is one way to honor their lives. My name is Linda Nemec Foster. As some of you may know, the war in Ukraine hits very close to home for me. All my family is from southern and eastern Poland. My father's parents and my mother's parents all immigrated from Poland before World War I. I have many relatives and friends who live there, and I've visited them multiple times. I've been to the Polish border with Ukraine it's a lovely, lovely landscape to visit my family. These same relatives and friends are aiding Ukrainian refugees. Some of them are taking them into their homes, and others are offering assistance in education, jobs, and social services. I'll be going to that part of the world again this summer to spend several weeks there. I'm grateful and honored to have been invited to join a select group of poets and writers who will be engaged in writing workshops and meetings with our Polish colleagues, poets, translators, and artists. We also hope to meet our Ukrainian colleagues who are now living in Poland, especially in the city of Jeshuv that has become such an important hub for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. As GF and David Cope know, I'll be taking some copies of Busy Grief's Raw Towns, our anthology, to distribute and share along the way. As poets, we have important things to say in this anthology, but the real significance here is not the poetry per se, but the reason behind it. To stand in solidarity with Ukraine and not let this unprovoked and brutal war fade from our collective memory the true heroes are the Ukrainian people who continue to fight, struggle, and survive. I'm in awe of their courage and sheer will. I'm honored by the stories I've heard about them from my family and friends in Poland. Now, my poem I'm going to read for you is at the opposite end of this scenario. It's the present-day monster in the Kremlin who is so intent on destroying the lives, culture, and identity of the people in Ukraine. He needs no introduction. Here he is. And my poem from the anthology is Newsflash, Putin bathes in deer antler blood. As if the blood of every Ukrainian wasn't enough. As if the blood on his hands from the massacre in Busha, the painted nails of a woman left on the sidewalk, or from the train station bombing in Karmatorsk, a boy stuffed toy covered in pigments of dark rust, as if that wasn't enough. Now we hear of Putin's health rituals, which include multiple consultations with cancer doctors in large rooms, the occasional bath 
in antler blood. Yes, antler blood in large tubs. An alternative therapy that improves the heart and regenerates the skin. Or so says one of his defense ministers. Of course, the deer has to be alive when the antlers are cut. Think of it as pulling out a person's fingernails, says an activist. But Russia might claim this is all fake news, an urban legend Putin's enemies created to besmirch their fearless leader. But back to the blood in Ukraine, his main concern. The flow so never-ending, every bathtub and every palatial dacha, every Black Sea resort, and every opulent hunting lodge that Putin owns, all of them, all of them, couldn't contain his obsession. I got a stool. I'm Joy Gaines Friedler. How to be happy. Tell the lady in two long dreads wearing a purple shirt and skirt, a purple scarf round her head, her two dreads long enough to sit on pushing a shopping cart through Lowe's with her old dog, who looks wise and kind. Foxy Brown, she calls him. With his paws up on the cart and his back end on the purple towel, tell this lady with her deeply lined cheeks that she is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Ask her if you can take her photo her and Foxy Brown, because she is so beautiful. Listen to her say, yes, baby. Then watch her pose and listen to, to her tell you how beautiful your own white hair is and ask her what her button says on her scarf. Listen to her say, it says, I got the vaccine. You want one? You want one too, honey? and watch as she takes the pin off her scarf and pins it on your shirt. Let that pin be a diamond brooch. Listen to her say, this is how everybody should be, kind, not like that crazy man killing people over there, killing everyone for nothing. This, this is what God wants, everybody to be kind then glow a little. Feel glad you went to Lowe's to buy nothing, just to look around, hug her, bow to her, throw her a kiss from the parking lot, let the day become as sacred as peace as she wishes you a blessed life. Hi, my name is Bill Holm. Um, thanks to GF and thanks to uh, Fountain Street for doing this. When I got up this morning, I was cold and grumpy and perturbed because we hadn't had power for 20 hours. Plus, our next door neighbor's extremely loud generator ran all night. And we're told it'll be a few more days before we have power again. Woe is me, right? And then I thought about tonight. I thought about people suffering in Ukraine, 
and why we're all here. This poem is about the cause of their suffering. It's called, oddly enough, Power. The blood of my mothers and fathers does not flow like buried rivers of tears. No underlife force pulses through my feet to lead my heart to the place of courage. No ancestral voice echoes through my years. Only the silence of shallow graves electrifies me. I feel wailing mothers and wounded fathers under my boots, and I chuckle. Such satisfaction. Children who will never grow to hate me lie in pieces or pick through what is shattered. Smoke on the horizon chokes souls, and I rejoice. Let them have their courage. Bloodless, my touch is death. Granted ownership, I lord it over. I assume possession, your skin, books, schools, words, grammar, art, song, money, mind. What's yours is mine. What's mine will never be yours. I kill the not I, feed on despair. Always my rules, never your way. In my way, get out. Every seed, every tree, every fish, every bird, everything green, all mine. I never ask what kind of God is this that trusts the likes of me with his creation. My God can count on me. I am his servant. My faith commands my battles. I must turn the earth until it turns my color and tilt it with terror so the sun never sets on me. I am here to murder wolves and giraffes, raise the seas and set it all on fire, turn water to mercury, air to stone, raise the seas and set it all on fire. Ruler, punisher, I use the gift, do what is necessary, chain you, monetize you, scatter, splatter, hack you, crack you. I lord it over. You're better off while you bleed and whimper. No courage can be found in men like me who own the world. Courage blesses the conquered, never forgets, never turns away draws from the earth the words heard when you defy and die. Courage digs early graves. I have hypersonic missiles. The blood beneath my feet is not mine, it is yours. I wield the golden sword under heaven, under God, under state, under scripture. Do what I tell you, do what I let you kill you, kill your dreams. I live to feed, I perpetrate, I perpetuate. The rules are clear, bow, assimilate, kneel, survive, gain certain privileges. Everyone is nothing but an insect. And I am Russia, I am China, I am Myanmar, I am Saudi Arabia, I am Syria, I am Somalia, I am Sudan, I am Afghanistan, I am England, I am the USA. I'll dilute you into me, you must obey, fear tremble. Tomorrow I break down your front door, your back door, your kitchen door, loot you, rip you from home, stuff you in a truck, your love in another, cage your children, shoot to kill, minimize, demonize everything you were, everything you are. This is your last chance. Did you hear me? This is your last chance. Did you hear me?
Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Rika Jalama. And just one note about the poem that I'm going to read tonight. Uh, it, it references an artist, and the artist is a, a real person. And uh, her name is B. Last. And she uh, lives and works in Scotland. And I've done some collaborative pieces, um, works written to her art. And I just thought that that would give some context to this piece that I wrote in response to, to the war in Ukraine. Thanks. This landscape is my sketchbook. I am drawing in it, and my sketches are red and red and more red. So writes the artist of her installation of scarlet swoops, ribboning trees in her native Scotland. Red, she says, for children whose tender flesh did not survive bombardment. She tells me her flowers have lost faith in their canvas. Her paintings have wilted. Overhead, the ash branches blanch at her artistic choices. Nothing addresses this madness. CNN goes on and on, a civilian's severed head, but surgeons reverse the damage? No color is bloody enough to express corpse-filled ditches. Her mosses flinch. Talk about invasive species, the artist says. She says, my daffodils clamp shut at the news feed. My sunflowers stretch their seeded heads, but their scope, it is limited. And my landscape, it is red. And on an icy day, when the rain falls sideways, more bombs, more subterfuge. I cannot respond on command. Although I have a paintbrush for pity and a paintbrush for apathy. And I have flowers out back who have become ambivalent. Daisies who regret that they sprang up at a temperate moment. Daisies nostalgic for rich soil and the sheer vitality of earthworms. We will never recover, say the sunflowers. Paint us scarlet. Thank you. My name is Katie Collish, and I'll be reading my poem. Uh, it's on page 38, if you're following along. Um, it's called Everyone Pretending. Every story has already been told, and originality is dead. A student from long ago emails me. One line, no greeting or signature. It's the same email he sent while he was in my class, and I receive it on a day that seems the same as then. Gray, cold, someone is sick. Perhaps he was trying to reconnect, to pick up on our old conversation. Perhaps he was waiting for the worst time to remind me, for February to settle into my knees and elbows, for even my daily bath to seem insipid. There is another Olympics going on under another duress. 
another picture of Putin sitting alone and cheering for Russia, marching without their flag. As usual, no one looks at him except the camera, everyone pretending it's not that bad, all of us just shaking our fingers at him like he's nothing but a five-year-old who just toppled a dime store vase with a baseball, like maybe it was an accident. My name is Neil Kaufman. I will be reading the poem, For Those Who Will Suffer From Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder As a Result of the War in Ukraine. The war on Ukraine will drive many Ukrainians to post-traumatic stress disorder, and many of those worldwide connected to them. I don't know much about the war because I already suffer from PTSD, and most days, can't handle the news. It wildly exacerbates my symptoms. What I do know about is poetry and mental health. I want to offer this prayer of hope. The most I can do right now is to pray, besides writing this poem to benefit you via the International Rescue Committee. That if you have intrusive memories and recurring nightmares or maybe have difficulty forming close relationships after this, characteristics of the illness, or any other symptoms of PTSD, that you will seek effective help that will be provided to you. Survivors of the war on Ukraine, don't feel guilty if you can't watch, read, or listen to the news about future wars because you have PTSD from this one. I won't judge you, as I pray you don't judge me. I'm G.F. Cork. Uh, you've seen me before. The poem I'm reading, it's from a poem in the book called Ukraine Travelogue. It's actually a series of uh, short poems. They're almost haiku-like, they're close. I'm not gonna read the entire poem, but sections of it. When last seen alive, her embrace was shared with the dog she rescued. Today, the dog searches for what is left of her. At the train station in a foreign city, their hands holding candles, thousands wait to meet loved ones for the first time. Her hands now absent of morning's work, brush ash from piano keys, release an exaltation of notes to chase smoke from the sky. A lone cyclist maneuvers between the sleeping, the unfound, lost among the gray that embraces her like a fist. The apartment leveled, save the stereo, playing Bach, the full score of sleepers awake to an audience of pigeons. She runs her fingers along the smoldering bark where their names once lived. Some got medals for Busha, all except the heroes. Thank you.
I'd like to say a couple of things about this poem just by way of introduction. I got the idea for it because when we were seeing a lot of footage on the news of Ukrainian people, something that I noticed was that you'd see a family fleeing. They have their clothes, they have their suitcases, children with them. Then a lot of times you'd see they had a cat carrier or they would have a dog with them. And uh, you know, I said, well, you know, people value their pets. They value animals and the animals suffer too. Then I saw a news report on the Ukrainian zoo and some of the difficulties that the animals there are encountering. And so uh, this poem came about from those, uh, those visions and uh, it's called The Animals of the Kiev Zoo. Some are familiar, donkeys, dogs, and some much more exotic, cheetah, zebra, lion. The safe domain, domain they lived in was torn down. The food sources they knew suddenly lost. They were bewildered in the thud and roar, incomprehensible sounds, rockets and bombs, environments altered, lions left helpless in the hippopotami lost in ice and cold. Exotic creatures from six continents declared the enemy and humans now work frantically to save them, to take them to safer environments however they can. Two tapers in the back seat of a car, red panda in a bag carried away to a secure place. Puzzled elephants, bewildered as the ones Hannibal took across the frozen Alps. They ride into the night, secreted, smuggled here and there, covered with blankets, borne off through the snow. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth McBride. And when I first started this poem, which is entitled Threat, the Russian troops were moving about along the borders of the Ukraine, assembling as if they might take action while their leader denied such intention. At attacks began, and I was struck by the realization that the aggression that we were seeing the threats of violence and the violence itself were all driven by the very same fears that they produce, loss of control, loss of independence, and the risk of need. The people of the Ukraine do not want to live in fear. The people of the surrounding countries do not want to live in fear. We do not want to live in fear. The people of Russia do not want to live in fear. Nothing changes until we begin to operate outside of the paradigm of fear and control through violence and the threat of violence. Honesty, generosity, respect, and trust bring peace. Let us give where there is need. Let us respect the rights of others. Let us develop and foster trust and peace in the world. This is entitled Threat. Invisible, sometimes even stronger for its apparent non-existence, all the while festering, infectious, fear wraps round the throat of witness Tenses the bound, taut trigger finger, pushes the palm that grips the lever, propels the foot, ousting ash and rubble, turns the eye from the remains of a garden, parkside bench, church, sculpture, fountain, evidence of tenderness for life for living, loved, and loving, all put far behind, brought forward by the peril of power controlled and driven by fear and nothing more. 
This spiraling complicity draws all vulnerability in, wielding the grip of threatened death over those defending, those attacking, those observing this great vacuousness that destroys all but the power of threat itself. My name is Mary McSchmidt. The first time I was in the Fountain Street Church was in 2005. I sat in one of these chairs in what was standing room only and listened to a coalition of scientists, government agencies, business leaders, mayors, tribes people, and others report on the health of the Great Lakes. They said that the Great Lakes were at a tipping point, and if steps weren't taken immediately, the health of 20% of the world's fresh surface water could be ruined, damaged beyond repair. I, like many in the audience, became an advocate for the Great Lakes after hearing that report. We, with the people of Grand Rapids, the people of West Michigan, people from communities all around this region, created the political will to get bipartisan legislation drafted, passed, and funded. Now, over 10 years later, over a decade later, that legislation, the, Grand, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, still exists and still is a priority for our Congress. I say this because when I heard and saw Russia entering into, invading Ukraine, I wrote this poem based on my experience as an advocate for the Great Lakes. At the time, I had had hand surgery, and so I was in a, a cast from my fingertips up to my elbows. And um, as you can see, my hands are healthy and functional today. But the message in my poem is the same, and perhaps even more important. Continued financial support for Ukraine depends on the political will of the American people. We must ask those rep people who represent us in Congress to make Ukraine a priority. We must insist that Ukraine be a priority their health, the future of their country, of their democracy, depends on that. So my poem tonight is titled, Standing United. With my one good hand, I type an email to my Republican congressman to thank him for standing united with the president, with Ukraine, with NATO, with all democracies, including ours, fighting to survive an invasion by a predator so common it has become invisible, like the PFAS in our water, yet so debilitating it threatens the health and lives of all. It is called power. And I'm going to before I step off the stage, I'm going to thank you in advance for taking a few minutes this weekend on the heels of Biden's unifying talk in Poland. I'm going to ask you to contact 
your elect, if you haven't done so, contact your elected representative in Congress and ask them to make Ukraine funding a priority. You can find your representative's email at house.gov backslash representative, find your representative. So let me say that again. House.gov backslash representative backslash find your representative. Thank you. It's up to us. My poem is on page 55. I wrote it in response to a call from GF, like so many other of you out here. Um, and I also wrote it in response to the fact that I believe every other person who is blessed with this much melanin told him no for various reasons, and I said maybe. Um, my name is Moor Salata Mohammed, and um, I also, this is the second time I'm reading a poem at an event, um, and I prepared that first time very, <laughs> a lot. And I didn't prepare at all this time. Um, but I, I wrote the poem out of a growing fear that my experiences would prevent me, my experiences as a black person in America would actually prevent me from creating something. And that's what I was afraid of that the inability to recognize inhumanity because of your experience could stop you from being inclusive. Um, and so that's what part this is in response to. Um, the title of my poem is a dyslexic follows the war on Ukraine. And I'm also blessed to have the wonderful gift of dyslexia. Um, and so it is my unpracticed reading that you will get today when I pronounce some of these words. Um, <clears throat> I also want to let you know that um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So, a dyslexic follows the war on Ukraine. Her brain pushes through the weird collection of familiar letters, an alphabet turned against itself in her mind, oddly similar to early memories of learning to read in a world that cared little for her excellent observational and systemic thinking skills. Blinking back tears, she breathes heavily. The marginalizing, unforgiving past with its phonetic, demanding, archaic social system comes barreling back from November 30th, 1991, morphing into right fucking now. Her eyes scramble across the words, dialo, isium, kasu, krimina, misfiring, 
disintegrating the coping mechanisms she's crafted meticulously over decades. There is no place to go but into the madness of violence heightened in too many news stories. So she leans into the latest version of inhumanity. Grasping at tyranny's coattails, it's her Hail Mary attempt to reconcile the combinations. Guneg, Kramantosk, Floyd, Rubizny, Gray, Sivan Donsk, Ellis, Donesk, Taylor, Maripol, Dubois, Slovnask, Gurley, Herlivka, Lioya, coaxing her brain to loosen her tongue enough to produce audible noises. Noises become sounds, sounds become city names where children die. Sludgingly, she makes her way into not so pretty mismatched pronunciations, finally arriving at saying the names of towns and individuals, saying each name turns people back into humans, making her more humane, saying their names turns her vicious enough to pounce upon tyranny, saying their names make her so desperate for human literacy that no level of alphabetical defamiliarization keeps her from reading what is just. Saying their names helps her muster the strength to face the wrath of children expecting more from today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mercilata. That was very powerful. I feel inadequate to follow that reading. Um, I happen, my name is Jeff Monroe. I happen uh, to be in the Virgin Islands a year ago today when the um, invasion of Ukraine happened. And it felt incredibly incongruent to me to be in. Uh, on this island in paradise while so many people were suffering. And um, one of the first images I saw was of a group of people in a, in the, in a metro station, in the, in the lower level of the metro station, using that as a bomb shelter. And I was struck by all the um, blue jeans and blue jackets and blue sleeping, sleeping bags and the blue Ukrainian flag um, and being in the Caribbean with the blue sky and the blue water and all the different shades of blue uh, really all just kind of rolled around in my head. So I wrote this poem and it's called Blue. Blue is inadequate. Blue sea, so different from blue sky. My faded blue shorts, different from my blue shirt while half a world away, the blue in the Ukrainian flag looks noble. And my blue feeling is for the children hiding underground in blue metro stations, wearing blue jeans and blue jackets and sleeping under blue blankets while blue flashes imprint blue trauma on the synapses of their young blue brains. Thank you.
My name's Jack Riddle. Thank you, GF. Jeff's uh, done way more for this than any of us could possibly know, and he's worried more about it. <coughs> uh, I'm, this poem asks you to help it out by leaving this cathedral and putting yourself in a seat on a bus. Titles on the bus to Poland. Where's Daddy? I don't know. Tell me why you don't know. I don't know why I don't know. When will we know? I don't know. I wish I did. Does Daddy know where we are? You mean on this bus? Yes. I think he does. I hope he does. I'm hungry. I know. I'm thirsty, too. I know. Do we have anything? We'll, we'll, we will later, I hope. How much is later? I don't know. Where are we going? A new country. Its name is Poland. Is it like where we live? Kind of. Are the people like us? I think so. Are they nice? I'm sure they must be. Does Daddy know we're going there? I think he does, yes. Will my friends be there when we get there? I'm hungry. I know you are. My friends, will they be there? I don't know. That would be nice. Did you bring Suzzy? I did. Suzzy's in that big bag. There are a lot of trees here. Yes, there are. I'm Barbara Sonier, reading tonight for Rodney Torrison, who couldn't be here. We like the dead to be blurred. We like the dead to be blurred as we watch ruins piled in our living room, keyed on television. I turn it off, and much of the high-rise rubble brought down or bombed up into the ironclad clouds, leans back toward the camera and falls back in. 
Still, my indulgent skill is shamed for its shiny things. Outside the house, I pay the price, then roll my eyes while the gas pump rolls its own. Against me, or maybe we're on the same side. Blindness never blinks. Putin plays his evil mostly straight, with missiles direct. Some in the Ukraine wait and pray for God to come in on a curve. No one, though, speaks like the dead. In the streets, perhaps, their eyes open as if to watch our next move, be it from greed or love. We like the dead blurred by the photographer, the corpses in the street, if we see them, to die politely, keep their mouths shut. Thank you for coming. Could you please help me thank everyone for their beautiful gifts this evening? Thank you so much, poets. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for being part of this. I want to thank GF again for this. And I'd like to thank one of our members who was with us tonight, Brad Miller, who initially reached out to me and said, hey, you said you might do something for a Ukraine one year. And I also have these connections. I went to this program at Schuler Books. So thank you, Brad, for helping bring this to life here at Fountain Street Church. Friends, it is good to be with each and every one of you. We have been saying since this war began here at Fountain Street that we need peace to begin with we. As the beautiful song goes, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And we can control the happenings of our heart and our homes and our communities. And so I do hope as you go forth from this place, you will carry that virtue with you closely. Let peace begin with we. Following this event, as you depart, we do still have books for sale. They are available for $20, and the proceeds go for go towards rather uh, ongoing relief work for re refugees who have been displaced from the war. So those proceeds go to an organization who specifically is working with refugees who have crossed the borders into Poland. And so I do hope that if you are interested in the book, you're able to buy it tonight, as the proceeds will go to that invaluable relief work. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. May you go in peace to make peace in this world. Thank you. <laughs>